Our scripture this morning comes from Mark's Gospel, 10th chapter, verses 35 to 45. Then James and John, the sons of Zebedee, came over and spoke to Jesus. Teacher, they said, we want you to do us a favor. What is your request, Jesus asked. They replied, when you sit on your glorious throne, we want to sit in places of honor next to you, one on your right and the other on your left. But Jesus said to them, You don't know what you are asking. Are you able to drink from the bitter cup of suffering I am about to drink? Are you able to be baptized with the baptism of suffering I must be baptized with? Oh, yes, they replied, we are able. Then Jesus told them, You will indeed drink from my bitter cup and be baptized with my baptism of suffering. But I have no right to say who will sit on my right or my left. God has prepared those places for the ones God has chosen. When the ten other disciples heard what James and John had asked, they were indignant. So Jesus called them all together and said, You know that the rulers of this world lord it over their people, and officials flaunt their authority over those under them. But among you, it will be different. Whoever wants to be a leader among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first among you must be the slave of everyone else. For even the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve others and to give his life as a ransom for many. I have trouble with being a servant. I have trouble with that word, servant. Um, I think a great deal of it has to do with having grown up in the 50s and the 60s and the expectations for females wasn't real high. Um, you went to school, you graduated, you got married, you had children, you did cooking, cleaning, housework, laundry, taking care of the children, all those kinds of jobs that um, never liked in the first place and still don't care for. It has a very negative connotation. It's like, but, but what do I get to do for myself? You know, when I was in, when I was in school, um, there weren't special things for females to do. There, wasn't, there weren't any sports for them, uh, not like there is today. If you went to college, the expectation was you would go maybe to become a nurse or a social worker or a teacher, or else you'd get married. All positions of serving others, but positions not of authority, not leadership positions, but positions almost at times, and I've worked as a secretary, and there are times when I felt absolutely subservient because that's the way I was treated by other people. So I don't like that idea. It just doesn't sit right with me. And I have to think about it quite a bit before I can actually jump on board. You know, James and John, were probably nice middle-class fishermen. They weren't poor, they weren't wealthy, but they had a good business. And they weren't servants because they were men. And they had their own business along with their father. And so they got to do what they wanted to do. They had others to serve them. And I wonder if when they misunderstood and had trouble with what Jesus was talking about. When he would do his servant sermons, when he would talk about children and becoming like a child to enter God's kingdom, um, to be the least, to uh, be a servant, if they weren't thinking, yeah, but that's for other people. That's not for us. That's not for us because 
We're the apostles. We're, we're in the leadership team. We're with, we're with the big guy here. We don't have to be a servant. We, we don't have to do that. Because I can't believe they were really so dumb that they didn't get what Jesus was saying. I think they did get it. And I think they thought that Jesus was talking about other people, about the authorities in the church, about the leaders, about those who were rich, about the rulers, about those who got to do what they wanted to do because of their position in the world. I think they thought they were exempt. I think they did, in fact, understand that what Jesus was talking about when he talked about God's kingdom was that it was an upside-down kingdom. It wasn't like kingdoms were in the real world. It wasn't about living by the society's rules. I think they knew that. But I think they also thought that they would be helping Jesus to rule. They wouldn't have to be servants. They wouldn't have to have lower status. Somehow I think they felt they were above that. The other disciples, when they hear what James and John were asking Jesus for, get angry. Not a righteous anger, but a jealous anger. They wanted to get there first, and the two brothers beat them to it. Jesus doesn't rebuke his disciples, which is part of why I think maybe they did get it, and he knew exactly that they did get it, and what it was that they were having trouble with. Because he goes on to talk about leadership in God's kingdom, to talk about being a servant. In Greek, the word for servant is the word that we use today for deacon, diakonos. In God's kingdom, serving is not because you have low status, but it's because of your faithfulness. It's because of your faithfulness to God and to Jesus. You model yourself on Jesus and his serving. Jesus was a servant leader, and yet Jesus was not bound by the whims of others. He didn't do whatever was asked of him, like we learned from today's lesson. People couldn't command and didn't command him on what he should and shouldn't do. He stood up for himself. And he was no less a servant at those times when he went into the temple grounds and overturned all the tables of the money changers. He was still being a servant of God because those money changers were taking up the space that Gentiles would come to worship him. Jesus contrasts Gentiles' leadership with God's kingdom leadership. He said the kingdom leadership is not about tyranny. It's not about domination. It isn't even really about effectiveness or who's quickest to get the job done. It's about faithfulness. It's about faithfulness to Christ, faithfulness to God. Think about the elders in a particular congregation. Do you elect elders who you know are efficient and quick and going to be effective without paying any attention to their faithfulness to God? Don't you want elders to lead this congregation who lead out of faithfulness? Now that's not to say that efficiency and effectiveness and faithfulness are mutually exclusive. But faithfulness is the most important attribute for a servant, for a servant leader, for an elder. It's a question of who is being served. Are you faithful to God or are you faithful to something else? 
Are you serving the world rather than serving God? Servant leadership is a type of leadership that's contrary to the way of the world. It always has been. Think about elected officials. Doesn't matter whether they're city, county, state, federal. The question is, who are they serving? Are they serving themselves or the bottom line? Are they serving a select few, you know, those groups that give them lots of money to run their elections? Or are they serving those who voted for them? Serving the people, serving the majority, doing what's good for the country. To me, the president, for example, and all elected officials are there serving at the will of the people. And it is to the people that they are to answer. It is to the people that they are in service. To God, first and foremost, and to the people, second. Servant leadership is about an attitude. It's about an orientation that colors all of your life. It's an orientation to God's kingdom, no matter what type of service you're in. Whether you're serving in government, whether you're serving as a teacher, whether you're serving as a doctor or a nurse, whether you're serving as a stay-at-home mom. It's having that orientation towards God's kingdom. It's about being humble, but not lowly. It includes time for self-examination, to look at one's motives and to see what they are, whether the motives are service or self-gratification. When I went to seminary, we took a survey, a test, whatever it was. They had all these kinds of things you had to do beforehand. And it was questions about why you wanted to be a minister. And some of your options, and, and I found this throughout, were, well, because I like wearing the fancy robes, although I don't have it on now. I do have them. Mm -hmm. It's about wearing the stoles with all the beautiful designs on them. It's about having people look up to you to, uh, to give you the place of, of honor, or are you doing it for another reason? Um, and you had to choose which one. And one of the reasons was to preach the gospel. And that's what I picked, because I had found such joy in my own life of faith. I just I wanted to share that. And I wanted to share the good news of the gospel. Well, they decided that I might not fit well into United Seminary because I was an evangelical, which I'm not, other than evangelical meaning someone who preaches. And that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to be that servant leader who shared the good news of the gospel. You know, I found out this week as I was working on this sermon and examining myself and my motives that um, I kind of changed a little bit as I spent the years in ministry. And I began to enjoy the status that went with being a minister. I enjoyed wearing the robes unless it was really hot. I enjoyed wearing um, the stoles. I enjoyed when we'd have a potluck. Guess who got to go through the line first? <laughs> when we went out to dinner, when someone invited me for lunch, they always paid. Now, it might have been because they knew how much money I made. Um, but, but there were perks, if you will, to being and I really enjoyed that. And then I began to think, well, you know, it's maybe not me that has to be the servant. Maybe it's other people that really don't get what it is 
that Jesus was preaching, I get it. I understand what Jesus wants us to do. But I think he's maybe talking to other people. And I think those other people are maybe the ones that don't have the same kind of theology I have. That they've got it wrong. They really don't understand what Jesus was talking about. But I do. And if they would just listen to me, they'd get it right. If they just listened to me, I could become the greatest preacher in the world. I could change lives simply by speaking. And that's what I wanted to do. That's what I wanted to be. That servant peace just to kind of flit it away. And I had to pull myself back. Living a life of servant leadership leads not only to a better self, but it leads to God's kingdom. It establishes God's kingdom every time we are a servant, every time. I have a picture at home that my mother-in-law gave me many, many, many years ago. Um, I don't know where she got it, but I really, really liked it. And so she gave it to me. And it's a picture of Jesus, and it's just the head, maybe the shoulders. It's colored. And as you look at it from a distance, that's all you see is the head of Jesus. But as you get closer and closer to the picture, you begin to notice that there are other faces in that picture. There are other faces that make up the face and the head and the shoulders of Jesus. People like JFK, Martin Luther King, Gandhi, Mother Teresa, Pope John Paul, Pope, well not Pope Francis because obviously he wasn't there 40 years ago. And it reminds me that it's not about one individual. It's not about having one's own needs met. It's not about being the world's best preacher. It's not about other people buying me lunch. What it's about is that from a distance, when people look, they should see Jesus instead of the individual servant leaders. For it is to service that we are called.